everybody. Thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. Tonight, we're so excited to welcome back retired Navy SEAL officer Andy Stump and retired Navy SEAL and CEO of Legacy Expeditions, Mike Sorrell. Um, Mike and Andy, you guys have been on before, and you are doing crazy stuff all the time, as I just was talking to you guys before we started recording this about. Last time we spoke, you had just finished the Triple Seven Expedition. Remind everybody, Mike, what that was and, um, and why it was so crazy for people who may not know. Crazy in my mind. Yeah, the the triple seven or seven 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 within the skydiving community has been like a running joke. It can't be done. Andy, myself, and uh, one of our colleagues, Nick Cush, who's retired Navy UD, sort of came together and say, hey, "Let's give it a shot." And so, after eighteen months of uh, intensive planning, fundraising, uh, and training, we pulled it off this past January, and uh, we set four world world records. Uh, total time was six days, six minutes, six uh, or six hours, six minutes. Uh, more importantly, we raised about $1.25 million for uh, Folds of Honor. And what is the expedition? You're, you're skydiving, right? Tell everybody what it is. Yeah, skydiving into all seven continents. Uh, it's supposed to be within seven days. Uh, realistically, people thought we weren't going to be able to do it, uh, you know, in less than uh, 10 days, um, more like 14. Wow. But again, we, we, you know, when people say impossible, uh, we, we hear improbable and we'll, we'll, we'll at least give it a shot. And we did. It worked out. We, there was a lot of luck involved. Yeah, I know. I remember you guys telling me the stories of, you know, flights being canceled and you had to like really scramble around to actually make it work. But you did it. As you said, you raised so much money for Folds of Honor, which is incredible that you're doing that. And Andy, that wasn't enough for you guys. You guys like were, were like, you know what? We're not tired of doing all of this wild stuff. I think it's awesome. Your next adventure, Drake's Fury Expedition, is, I guess, the title of it. Um, we talked about the Drake's Passage last time you guys were on, and it is basically world-renowned as one of the most dangerous bodies of water to cross between South America and Antarctica. Um, I, I, I mean, what's going on? What are you guys planning to do? What's coming up next for you? I mean, I think it's fair to say there's a difference between somebody wanting to cross the Drake's Passage on their own and being willing to support another group of people that want to do so without actually dipping your feet into the physical or metaphorical water. Mm. Um, I am not a fan of small watercraft after uh, almost 17 years of being tortured with the elements, but I'm totally supportive of other people who want to torture themselves, <laughs> uh, which is kind of where the idea of the Drake's Passage comes from. Mike actually knows far more about, because uh, he, he was involved in the original planning process for this with the other uh, group. So I'll let him take it away and kind of explain a little bit more of what it is. Uh, challenging to say the least, but in a, in a way that I think is far more difficult um, and complex than what we did with the 777. I mean, we were largely waiting and scheduling based around commercial airline travel. The variables involved in Drake's Passage, uh, much more consequential. Yeah. I would say so, Mike. Tell us, tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Andy and I were asked by the individual who came up with this concept if we wanted to be part of the team, and our answer quickly was no. But no. we'll support you, <laughs> and, and we'll lift we'll lift up our brothers. So, six special operators uh, from pretty much every you know from the Rangers to the SEALs to Air Force Special Operations um, to to Marsoc and Force Recon. These guys are going to give it a shot. Uh, they're going to do a series of three rows, starting with the Gulf of Mexico, then the Great Lakes ultimately culminating uh, in Drake's Passage. Uh, and we could not be more proud of them. And of course, like I said, we're gonna lift up our brothers and we're gonna support them. Um, now, that said, uh, we recently made the decision to postpone 12 months. Uh, as uh, Andy knows, in the military, we say no plan survives first contact, the enemy gets a vote. Well, the current economic climate uh, with sponsors, you know, the, the most common phrase we're getting is, God, if you guys can just wait one year to 18 months, we're, we're fully into support. So they didn't, we didn't hit the, uh, the the financial requirements to pull this off, but, that, you know, we're undeterred. The, you know, the, the reaction of these guys was not, hey, let's quit and throw it in. No, then over the next 12 months, we'll attack the fundraising. We'll get in better shape. And once we have the funds in 12 months, we're, we're going to go right back on plan. So could not be more proud of the guys and how they've handled this adversity. 
uh, and the fact that they didn't post, you know, they didn't cancel it. They've just postponed it. But wow. uh, Andy and I have uh, a new one coming up, uh, Drop Zone Moab, coming up in October. We've already got sponsors lining up. So we're going to skydive into Moab, into the River Valley, uh, right next to the river, what we call an unknown DZ or a confined uh, DZ. Uh, and then one day of whitewater rafting, class five, and then one day of off-roading with an amazing group of special operations guys. And we may have some uh, celebrities uh, joining us uh, right now. There's conversations going on. But again, the whole point is uh, that camaraderie, uh, demonstrating the brotherhood through adventure, and more importantly, raising some more funds for, uh, for Folds of Honor. I love it. Well, first of all, how sad that that we are in a time right now where you can't just go out and and raise money for good causes because people really are, are struggling. I mean, it, it's a very tough time financially, I think, for a lot of people. But I love that you guys were like, listen, OK, we'll we'll delay it. So is the plan then winter of next year that this is going to happen? Yes. Winter of 2025. So either December of 24 or January of 25. Okay. Right back on uh, on track. And, you know, it is it is uh, disappointing, but a lot of this, needless to say, is uh, our self-inflicted wounds with where we're at with the economy. Yeah, well, I, I understand that. Um, so then the the entire journey is, I mean, a, a, again, a gro- across the Drake's Passage and these other bodies of water like you guys just detailed. This is in a, a rowboat. Is that is that accurate? It's a rowboat. It's, wow. it's a specialized rowboat with two capsules on each end that can sleep about two guys. So six guys total, uh, three on rowing for 90 minutes, the three in the capsule sleeping for 90 minutes. And they're going to maintain that from anywhere from eight to 12 days on a 90 wow. on 90 off. So you talk about crushing sort of your endocrine system. These guys are, they're not going to be normal afterwards. or They're not going to be right. It's going to take them a long time to return uh, physiologically to, to sort of their normal state. So, but, you know, again, it's, it, it's about the camaraderie you feel. I mean, these guys will be thicker than thieves by the time this thing is over. I and imagine. that is a sweet feeling to, to be part of a team like that where the bonds are so tight. A lot of people never get to uh, experience that in life. Andy and I have had the fortunate pleasure. That's why when people, you know, thank us for a service, dude, serving was a privilege. And I couldn't imagine life without feeling that brotherhood that Andy and I, uh, Andy and I had. And so Legacy Expeditions tries to give that back to uh, as many of the vets uh, as we can and, and to feel that feeling again. And so you two are not actually going to be in this capsule, so to speak. Is that that's accurate? Andy? No, ma'am. I yeah. don't like small watercraft. I don't <laughs> no. like variable ocean conditions. I've had my fill of that. Yeah. I actually I actually view the delay as a very positive thing. You know, okay. to go back to the triple seven, I still think, Mike, we have to check the clock. Six days, six hours, six minutes. I am sorry. That is far too convenient. We got to double check the math on that one. Bring in uh, Glover to run the numbers. What's missed in making the triple seven successful was the 18 months before it which was actually the uh, the planning process that went into it. So additional time for one, you actually have to, you know, <clears throat> we have to, by we, the team that's going to be on the boat, they need to go through a process to figure out who they can work well with mm-hmm. and identify friction points and determine whether or not they can work through that friction point or make a personnel change. Um, I think everybody is capable of being an effective member of a team, but not everybody can fit the role that might be required of them on every single team. So they have to work that out. It gives them time to refine equipment. It gives them time to do uh, just conditioning leading up to the actual row itself across Drake's Passage. And it would be, you know, to use a a model that we used, uh, Mike and I, back in the SEAL community. Uh, I can't speak for Mike's experience, but I think I know his answer on this one. 99 times out of 100, the training environments that we would create for ourselves exceeded the demands of what we encountered actually on target overseas. And that was by design. That's not accidental. Right. Why would you not, if given the opportunity, push yourself as hard, if not harder, than what the real world is going to present you with? And that's what this extra time will really allow for. So I view it as a good thing. Um, I'm glad we had 18 months leading up to the 777. I don't, you, Mike, do you think we would have even been successful if we would only had six months to plan? I don't think we would have not, been able to. Not not at all. And, and yeah, you know, Andy, yeah. to your point, man, you remember the two things we'd always ask, like, is it mis- is mission critical or is time critical? And, you know, with these, Laura, time's not critical. 
you just mm-hmm. delay and you've got to re- you've got to remove the emotion when you're so like invested in this project like uh triple seven that andy and i were as much as we wanted it to succeed we weren't going to make emotional decisions for convenience that could put somebody at risk right. and there was times that andy had to, had to had to back me off and say hey you're, you're too close to it that's not what we're doing we're doing this because it mitigates risk we'll still get the mission done um and that's what's most important not time yeah. and as disappointed as these guys are uh you know, we're already having a meeting today to, to reset the plan so that they can ultimately succeed. And if it's in 2024 or 2026, what, what does it really matter? Yeah. I mean, the only thing I keep thinking about, and, and obviously the only comparison I have to something like this is I do triathlons, right? That That's something that, that I enjoy doing, but there's a certain amount of training that goes into that. And, and whether it's a triathlon, whether it's a, a marathon, whatever it is that, that I've trained for, you do have to plan around the time frame of of when an event is happening. And so I imagine the individuals who are going to be actually doing this row across Drake's Passage. Has that ever been done before, by the way? Is is this a first time thing or has that been done already? So it's been done by one group. And uh, you know, very sort of a uh, matter of fact is they had to postpone two consecutive years. Wow. Because they failed to, to, to raise the, uh, the funding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the one group did it in 12 days. Uh, they were very experienced, uh, you know, uh, oceanic rowers. Mm-hmm. This group is not. But don't underestimate the ability for, uh, for, for special operations guys to pick up something very quickly uh, to a point that makes them at least competent enough to give it a shot. And I'll give you an example. Andy, how many uh, had you ever flown a wingsuit six months prior to when you set the, uh, the records? Oh, no. I agreed to do wow. that before I'd ever put a wingsuit on. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, don't confuse. It, what Mike is talking about is in a very professional manner. I'll give you the brass tacks. Yeah. Oftentimes, the people who come into special operations, we like to confuse our enthusiasm for our capability. Um, but we can just get away with it due to luck a lot of the times. But it's like, yes, we can do this. And then you're trying to Google what it is you just agreed to do, which is yeah. what happened with me with that wingsuit world record. Wow, that's amazing. But I mean, nonetheless, this this will require a very specific type of training, I imagine, to execute something like this. And you know what? Anyone who would go into any sort of special forces unit in the United States military has a certain mindset. And it's probably the mindset of a, a lot of athletes, elite athletes, people who do things that other people may consider a little extreme or a little crazy. I know people come up to me all the time and friends of mine, and they're like, I would never do a marathon. I would never do a triathlon, but I do. And I like it, but you have to have a certain type of, of mindset. And you I feel like your brain has to work almost in a certain way. And Andy, it's a little bit of what you said. Um, but you just have to convince yourself that you can do these things. And it is a good lesson for all of us. I think in that, if you, think up here in your head that you can do something, your body will oftentimes follow and do things that you actually will shock yourself that you'll be able to do. This is probably something like that. But I I imagine the training that goes into this, these guys are going to have to, you know, reconfigure a little bit and, and train based on the time that it actually happens. Um, and so that's fine if they have a, a goal in mind and if it's next next winter. And is it is the winter the good time to do it because you have it's it's actually the seasons are switched based on it being the southern hemisphere? Is that why is that the only time yeah. you can do it? Favorable sea conditions. Okay. So, yes. Especially in the Drake's area. So the reason we're gonna do the Gulf of Mexico during the uh, the winter is to to get the conditions as cold as possible, even during the summer in the Drake's passage it's still colder than the Gulf of Mexico in January. Right. Uh, so, if, you know, to Andy's point with the training, if we can replicate the conditions as much as possible, it sets the guys up for success. Mm-hmm. Laura, when, when you talk about special operations in the mindset, you know, it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, you know, there's making it through selection and training, SEAL training, which we look for certain attributes. But then it goes much further than that, where, where some guys have the necessary attributes to become very good at the job and make tactically prudent calls. You'd be surprised how many guys, even in the SEAL teams, uh, finally get to a combat zone and they're just not cut out for it. They just don't have the uh, the right attributes. But uh, additionally, you brought up the training. 
this is where, you know, Andy uh, says, you know, without the 18 months, we wouldn't have been successful at the triple seven. Fa- favor doesn't fortune the bold. Favor or fortune favors the uh, the prepared. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we've got John Wellborn, uh, who played 10 years in the NFL. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of Power Athlete. He's leading all the physical preparation. Then you've got Kristen Holmes from Whoop, who's monitoring all their vitals and all their recovery. And then Dr. Uh, Kirk Parsley, uh, a retired Navy SEAL and renowned even performance doctor, looking at the blood work, the diet and things. So we put together these teams and ultimately your success comes down to the support team behind you, just like we were in Triple Seven. We had the easy yeah. part. Travel from Miami to Barcelona, jump out of a plane, then do uh, Egypt, jump out of a plane. That was the easy part. The support team in the background, making sure that the flights were set up, the flights were changed rapidly if we ran into uh, to obstacles. They were the ones that really secured success for us. It's, I mean, I get it. Very smart. Uh, Andy, if people want to learn more about this or they want to donate or, or get involved somehow, where can they find out more information? Mike, have we set up a specific portal? Where would you direct people towards? Uh, yeah, so legacyexpeditions.net. Um, okay. They, they can find out a lot about our cause. We've got the documentary on Triple Seven, which Dan Myrick, the director producer of the Blair Witch Project, is working on. I think that's going to be a February release. Uh, most likely not in California, anywhere else, but uh, but California. No offense to my home state, Navy's home state. Um, and Laura will extend you an invite, but even more so, you know, Laura, October 24th to the 27th, Moab. If you're up for it, now I'm putting you on the spot, Andy Me? and I are. Oh, wow. If you want to jump, if you want to jump in with us and go whitewater rafting and off-roading, don't, don't, you know, don't tell me you've got a, a <laughs> schedule conflict. You've got enough time to move that and, uh, and join us. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I've never even considered it. What type of training? Now see, here's where I come in. What do I need to do to prepare for such a thing? I don't know. I, I don't even know if I've ever whitewater rafted per se. What, can, do we think I could do this? I think so. Do you think you I, could I do think, it? Andy, is the I actual question that matters. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> there you go. Mindset. Okay. I know. See? But uh, okay, already the wheels are spinning. I well, I appreciate the invitation. And by the way, I still have not jumped out of an airplane since the last time the three of us talked. I know I made that clear to you guys last time. I still have never been skydiving. Uh so this would be a lot of first for me. Is that acceptable for that to be my first time to to be doing it there? Yeah, for sure. All right. You have it. There you have it. Yeah. Tandem okay. operations are not as complex as people would uh, necessarily think. They're inherently safe, not inherently dangerous. Um, and there's a lot of things. Again, it jumping out of the aircraft is a portion of it. Having the dr- uh, drop zone support, they're waiting for us. All of the things that go into it is actually, again, what makes it successful. The, the testing of the gravity, which has had the same result every time I've done it for over 20 years, is the easy part. Okay. Well, oh, all right. I'm going to I'm going to look into it and I will let you guys know. Maybe we'll have a very exciting part 3 of this uh series with with the three of us. This this could be very cool. Before I let you guys go, Mike, I have to ask you about an op-ed that you penned this past 4th of July titled It's Time to Ditch Today's Dominant Values and Revisit the Spirit of 1776. Tell our audience a little bit more about that and your goals for this op-ed. Well, Andy and I actually have uh, co-penned a number of op-eds uh, for Fox News uh, up to this point about shared adversity, um, a, a call to action, a return to American exceptionalism. Uh, Andy and I couldn't come together on this one, but you, we, we feel the same. What you're seeing is the current modern values uh, highly contrast uh, the values we held dear in 1776. And what we mean by that is look at personal responsibility. Yes. Uh, it's been replaced by victimhood and blazing, uh, blaming everyone else. Uh, you've got uh, big government compared to, you know, our founding fathers put everything on the line and risked it for small government, for small government intervention. Um, and, and that uh, right there for what our, our, our founding fathers fought for and the fact that they put everything on the uh, the line. What I mean by that is the, the, the result of stepping against uh, tyranny is they would have been hanging from a noose in a public execution. And they were willing to sacrifice that for the good of, of the future of our nation. And you're not seeing that selflessness anymore. You're seeing a, a divisiveness that that is just in, you know, I don't want to speak for Andy. It's, it's disgusting. That's not why we went overseas. When we were overseas, we were dependent on you all to figure it out here. And then to come home to this state of affairs is is really demoralizing for a lot of the vets who who fought to defend our uh, our freedoms. 
Yeah, well, and it doesn't help anyone. Telling people that they are a victim and continually pushing that narrative and that message to people, I mean, how does that help? How does that ever get people to a place where they say, hey, I can do things. I can rely on myself. I can be successful. I'm going to go out and do a, a hard day's work and feel pride for doing it. It actually takes us in the wrong direction. It takes us away from that. And Andy, I don't know for, I, I agree with, with what Mike said, but it really yeah. seems like in a way you guys are both trying to bring us back to the era of uh, American exceptionalism. Cause that, I mean, that's where we existed for a long time in this country. People had pride in our country. We loved to celebrate accomplishing big things here. And it does feel like in many ways we're kind of moving away from that. And I think for a lot of people, they say, well, well, what will that ultimately mean for, for our country? And isn't it good for us all to rally around things together and celebrate accomplishments and, and positive things together as, as a country and as a nation? I believe so. I'm hopeful that actually the vast majority of people still feel the way that you described. I think they are drowned out by a tsunami of a very, very vocal minority. Um, I, I truly think that the vast majority of Americans kind of sit in the middle of the polar opposites and they're, and they're far quieter. Um, but, you know, to go to Mike's point about victimhood and what you spoke of as well, you know, you can condition people to always look for something in particular. And I've seen this played out many times. Um, it's, it's as simple as having a conversation with somebody and you ask them, well, how many red cars did you see today? Well, for the rest of their day, what they're end, that they do is they see an, a normal amount of red cars, not because there's more red cars or stop signs is another one. It's not that there's any more. It's that you're looking for it. And when you spend your time looking for something, you're more often than not going to find it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it, pre it presenting itself in a way that is realistic in nature as far as like the likelihood to experience it. But there is, for reasons I can't wrap my head around, it does seem to be a desire to push people towards this thought process of being a victim. And the United States isn't perfect by any stretch. You know, Mike and I have, have definitely traveled uh, our fair share around the world. Our country has problems. I think all countries have problems. I think the the countries or the problems that most countries face all are maybe not solvable, but they can be improved upon. And I feel the same way about the U.S. But we, I think we have to shift people's focus away from constantly looking for the subpar with the uh, desire to throw the subpar in everybody's face and say, there's nothing that can be done about this to if we identify something that is subpar, how about we commit to doing whatever we need to do to improve that? Um, you know, the two, they're very different. It actually goes back to something you said earlier about adversity. I really think there's two types of people. Um, there's people that look at adversity as a stumbling point, And then there are people who look at adversity as fuel and motivation. And I would say largely the people who are successful in special operations have a heads, uh, headspace of the latter they encounter. That's what training is really about, actually, especially early on in the pipeline. You just fail all the time. You do something one day that was rewarded and the next day you fail. And it's not really about the failure or success. It's about the instructors applying the curriculum and watching what happens when people fail. Do you mentally crack when that happens? Because if you do, you have no business in special operations. You have to be able to accept failure, to move with failure, and to allow failure to grow. You know, you find who you are on the other side of adversity, not by going around it and talking about, oh, somebody else should go handle that. So it, it the special operations community might be unique in that mindset, but that mindset would have such a powerful impact if people could shift away from, look at all the ways that I'm either oppressed or victimized um, or stepped upon. And not that those things don't happen, but if that's all you're looking for, that's all you're going to see. And I just don't think that's reflective of where we actually are as a country. Yeah. I mean, what a good point. You're, you're exactly right. People are going to see it if, if they're looking for it. And, and a lot of people are being told, this is what you should look for. Look at this. You should only focus on this. And unfortunately, it's it's not helpful for people. And I don't think it it is long-term positive for any one person or for us as a whole in the United States healthy. of America. Yeah. Not only is it not helpful, I actually think that you can get physically ill from constantly yes. looking for those negative things. I mean, it's like a you're a metaphorical bag of tea that's placed into a, a cup of hot water. The longer you spend in that water, the more it just bleaches out into the water and the thicker it becomes. Uh, it's a dangerous place to be. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, nonetheless, you guys are are inspiring a lot of people with what you are doing at Legacy Expeditions. Um, so it's on the other side of of the coin. And again, the website legacyexpeditions.net. Is that right, Mike? That's correct. Okay, so people should go check it out. I have been now formally invited to participate in one of your crazy <laughs> expeditions, which I love. I heard love. you saying that that was a lock. I, I heard a hard calendar <laughs> commitment <laughs> on that. I'm, well, I'm, I'm seeing the slow. Oh, I've got a, I've got a. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, guess. we'll have to play the tape back, but I'm pretty sure yeah. she's mm. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll report back on that. Yeah, I love that you guys can be on the spot like this. Perfect. Uh, I love nothing more, quite frankly, than than having somebody throw something at me like this. This is all good. Uh, well, listen, we'll see what happens in October, late October. It sounds like October twenty fourth. Is that correct? Yep. Twenty fourth okay. to the twenty seventh. We've already checked with your staff. You've got nothing on the books. So <laughs> it looks Darren like Darren already told are, you. Uh, you got something on the calendar now, but it wasn't there 15 minutes ago. Yeah, I'll check, I'll check my phone in a minute. Uh, <laughs> other than that, people can donate. They can find out more about the, the Drake's Passage crossing and, and all of that at Legacy Expeditions as well. And good luck with everything, guys. I think everything you're doing is very exciting and, and, and really, again, inspirational, I think, for a lot of people and something that we can all kind of look towards these days whenever it feels like eh, things going the right way. What, what can we do to help one another? And the great news is you're raising money for a great cause. So both of you, Mike and Andy, thank you for joining us here at the right view. I guess I'm going to see you in October, um, somewhere overseas in an in, unknown area to me, but we will report back on that. And, and until our, our next encounter, thank you both for joining us here at the right view. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Laura. All right. To everybody at home, as always, make sure you like, subscribe, share, and follow. And we'll see you back here next time for more of The Right View. So I'm like a lot of people. I love to wear an Apple Watch, but I hate how it looks. And I scoured the internet to search for the best looking Apple Watch cases I could find, and I found it. Goldandcherry.com. They have absolutely beautiful watches, as you can see here. Everything is waterproof. Everything looks good with different outfits. You can get sporty, you can get fancy, but they are great quality, uh, made out of Delaware in the United States of America. And they have been kind enough to give me a promo code that I can share with you if you want to get your hands on one of these as well. It's Lara T, L A R A T is the promo code to get yourself a discount at goldandcherry.com. And not only do they make Apple Watch cases, they also make great products for iPads and iPhones, keyboards, your desktop, everything you could possibly need goldandcherry.com. Use promo code Lara T so you can get yourself one of these today too. At The Right View, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we are independent. We get to say everything that we think and everything that we feel. We have no woke companies guiding us or telling us what we can and cannot say. We are always going to shoot you straight and give you the facts as we know them. And that's why it's important to support independent uh, outlets like The Right View. My name is Lara Trump, and I think Mike Lindell is a patriot. He is someone who loves this country, is willing to fight for this country. Um, I love my pillow because not only are my pillows made in the USA by American workers, uh, but they're great products and they're so great that not only do I use them in my own bed at night, my children actually requested, my daughter the other day went to the closet and pulled out a MyPillow and said, this is the pillow that I wanna sleep with. And I gotta tell you, she loves it and will have nothing to do with any other pillow. So it's a big hit around our house. My dogs also uh, happen to sleep on my pillow dog beds. So all around the Trump household, we're big fans. If you go to MyPillow.com today, and use promo code TRUMP. Again, promo code TRUMP. 
You will not only save money, but you will help us continue this show and other shows like it and help us continue the fight for the future of America. Inflation has impacted all of our lives. I don't think anyone can go to the gas pump or the grocery store without noticing that it is a major factor. And unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. It doesn't seem like it's going down in the way that we would like it to. And one way to protect your money is by investing in precious metals, uh, gold and silver. That's always been a great way to make sure that you keep your money and you keep it safe. When you go to bh-pm.com, use promo code TRUMP. That way, if you decide you want to invest in gold and silver, you'll save yourself a little bit of money. We live in a time that's very interesting. Uh, a lot of us out there feel like a lot of our rights are slipping away. And if you're like I am and you want to have the right to choose whether or not to have a vaccine, how to live your life freely, and you're looking for a great doctor, I've heard amazing things about Dr. Sherwood. He's somebody who you should really check out and check into, um, and it'll help support this program and keep us going. So go to Sherwood.tv and use promo code Trump. Again, Sherwood.tv and use promo code Trump. You can save yourself some money and help us keep our program going.